Hi, I'm Dr. Evan B. Howard, and this is our first in a series of lectures on the spirituality of Christian worship. I'm so glad you're here, and I look forward to having this class with you and this series of lectures. Worship to me is one of the most fundamental acts and attitudes in religion. And worship takes on a very special and kind of wonderful character in Christianity in particular. Worship is something most of us Christians do every single week. We go to a worship service. But most of us have not thought very carefully about what it means to be going to this worship service. What are we doing? Over the years, I have been both encouraged and challenged in my explorations of Christian worship. And I hope in this series of lectures that you will be both encouraged and challenged as you learn about your own patterns of worship. In this first lecture, what I want to do is to try and set the stage for the whole series. I want to say something first about the notion of worship in general, particularly uh, its relational and then its interpersonal character. And then I want to talk about how worship is both an individual and a corporate kind of uh, gathering or, or an event or, or character. So, those are, that's what I want to be moving forward in this first lecture. Number one, then, the very notion of worship is rooted in relationship. Think about what worship is, the, the synonyms that we use for worship, reverence, honor, regard, submission, devotion, all of these kind of terms go along with the notion of worship. Well, what's involved in those things? What's involved? I'll speak specifically about reverence. Reverence is both an activity and an attitude. Specifically, some of the biblical terms for worship, you know, referring to bowing down or kneeling or prostration. There's an activity involved in expressing reverence. It's something we do. But it's not just something we do. It's also the way in which we do that. You could, you could bow down in lots of different ways. Or in some cultures, I was thinking of some of the cultures where um, you actually blow a kiss to the, um, the deity or someone that you honor or revere. Well, blowing a kiss is very different that when we say goodbye to, to a friend or a loved one, then when we would be honoring or worshiping a deity. Very, very different. So the reverence then brings us first to the idea of a worshiper. Whereas this is some attitude we take, a quality of an action. The, the very character of this action involves a worshiper, someone who is expressing this reverence. But then, on the other side, worship involves, or reverence involves, this extravagant admiration for or devotion to an object, something out there, an object of esteem. Something else, the, the, the um, direction of our worship is pointed at something. So not only do you have a worshiper, but you have a worshipped. The worshiper and the worshipped, where we offer the honor or the regard. You can even have this with regard to something that's not even human. Uh, you talk about a person who worships the almighty dollar. And you see the honor or regard or devotion that we have, even towards uh, some object like uh, material wealth. But worship with a worshiper and a worshipped takes on a special character when that object of worship is actually personal. Worship here, at that point, when it's personal, becomes kind of an admiration, an adoration, a special reverence that we offer another person. 
And there, you've got a whole new network of feelings and, and thoughts and experiences that are involved when the worshipped is personal rather than just like an almighty dollar. And that's why we say, you know, you could say about my attitude toward my wife, he worships the ground she walks on. And you see that much more is involved in that than just worshiping the almighty dollar. Uh, and that's actually, uh, honestly, what uh, pieces of what a good love story is about is when that adoration takes on a personal character. But the other thing I want to point out, not only do you have a worshipped, uh, I'm sorry, not only do you have a worshipper, not only do you have a worshipped, but the point I hear I'm drawing with my hands is that this is a relationship. I'm saying worship is ultimately relational. It is a basis, it's based on a relationship of unequals. That's the whole point. Worship is a relational dynamic of unequals. The idea of value and supreme value comes into play when we have the idea of worship. When I worship um, God or I worship even a person, you know, I'm declaring that person or that God to be unequal to me, of much, much greater value. The worshipped embodies the value. The worshipper um, gives that value or places that value on someone. And that's why even the biblical words for worship, you know, the bowing, the kneeling, the word for serve um, is a slavery term. Clearly in all of these terms for worship that are used, there is this idea of unequality. Uh, I am being subservient to something absolute that I am worshiping. And this idea of value is so much stronger. Now, what I want to communicate out, out of this then is that for some of us in the West, that's not a very common Notion. In fact, it's somewhat unfamiliar. Whereas in other cultures, you know, maybe the idea of bowing or reverence to someone, uh, uh, elders or leaders, is a bit more common, or deity even. In the West, um, that's an unfamiliar term. We, we tend to be democratic. And we think of ourselves, we shake hands with our equals. Um, we, we meet in circles. And so, uh, I, even I, I did my doctoral work in Berkeley, and the automobiles, uh, some of the automobiles would be driving around with bumper stickers that would say, question authority. Well, that's in some ways the exact opposite of worship, where you are unquestioningly praising authority. And so I think sometimes for us in the West, worship this idea of subservience, of bowing, of, of honoring and reverence, uh, it doesn't come easy for us. And I just want to note at the very beginning of this series of lectures on worship is that it might not be easy for us. So, first of all, worship can be looked at in terms uh, as a relationship. Worship as a relationship can be looked at as reverence. Now, the next thing I want to point out with regard to worship as a relationship is that it's not just reverence. It's not just a life, an activity or a quality of an activity. It's also a life orientation. So um, in, in a religious context, specifically religious context, oftentimes we will talk about, well, who do you worship? And do you worship this God or do you worship that God? And we're not speaking just of cultic behavior. We're not just speaking of attitudes of reverence. We're speaking of a total life orientation. Um, a life practice. Who do you consider supreme value? The one that orders all dimensions of your life. That's the, that's the God or the person you worship. And so um, I want to acknowledge right from the front here that worship not is, is not just reverence. It's not just an action or action attitude. It also is a total life orientation. And then the third thing I want to point out now about worship as relationship, as a relationship term, is that it's a term that um, involves, or can involve, an event. Uh, an occasion for reminding ourselves or re, uh, of that relationship or reorienting ourselves towards this relationship of unequals. Um, we call that a worship service. So we have some kind of event where people gather, a periodic rehearsal 
of our fundamental orientation towards this supreme value. So worship as reverence uh, and a worshiper and a worship, worship as a total life orientation towards this supreme value, and then periodically we can have a worship service, an event uh, around which we reorient ourselves towards that supreme value. So you got that? There we are. Worship is, is fundamentally relational in its orientation. Now the second thing that I want to point out about worship in this first um, lecture is that Christian worship, specifically Christian worship, is an essentially interpersonal encounter. Whereas I can worship a piece of art, I can worship the almighty dollar, I can worship you know things out there and it's impersonal and I can give regard for it, I could bow down, we could have meetings and talk about the wonders of art and you know, but when it's Christian then what you have is the presence of a personal God. Indeed, a presence of an interpersonal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which makes God essentially interpersonal. And then in Christian worship, that God is actually present. And, and you've got to realize, it's a worship takes on a whole different characteristic when the worshipped, when the object of my worship is actually present there at that moment. I mean, it's very different when, say, I, I worship this movie star that I've never met, I don't even know, uh, from uh, worshipping my wife or worshipping someone who is present and even present right there in the midst of that worship. The essential character of the Christian faith is interpersonal. God is present. God is present in the form of the Holy Spirit in a Christian gathering. Therefore, it's not just a matter of offering reverence, but there is an actual interpersonal encounter, a real give and take among God and person, among worshiper and worshipped. Presence changes things. Consider, for example, the Book of Common Prayer, or in the, in the Anglican Church in England, it's actually called the Book of, of Common Worship. And, and there, in morning prayer, we say the following, Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence, notice this, the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth His praise, to hear His Holy Word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life, and our salvation. Here you've got diverse actions. We are setting forth praise. We are hearing. We are asking. And in the midst of these diverse actions, God is present. The Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, is present and it changes the very character of those actions. They're relational actions. I can, I can praise an ordinary person. Hey, you look good today. I can reconcile. I can do confession. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I can listen. I can speak. I can make requests. All of these are interpersonal actions. And they all take on a completely different character. When the other with whom I'm doing these interpersonal actions is one, present, and two, a worshipped one who is the object of my supreme value. So Christian worship, I want you to see then, is essentially an interpersonal encounter with the one that we are worshiping. Third, worship is both personal and corporate. Let's talk about the idea of a self. What is a self? A self is a composite of thoughts and memories, and feelings, predispositions, and so on. Thus, we can talk about my idea or my feeling I had yesterday or, you know, I am an extrovert. I have these habits. Now, a self grows over time with experiences and encounters, habits, and things like that. I could talk about the fact that this maybe one, you know, a few days ago I fell down the stairs. That was an experience I had. I, I met my wife, and this is true by the way, I met my wife on our first day of high school. Or, for better and worse, I could say, I like to be right. This is a tendency I have. I like to be right. 
So a, a, a self is this composite of thoughts and feelings and, and actions and experience and it grows over time. And thus I can talk about I. I as this center of all of this or I as this composite in some loose fashion of, of all of that. So that's what a self is. But not only do individuals have selves, but communities have selves. What are community selves? Well, the same thing. Composites of memories, thoughts, feelings, predispositions, and so on. Thus, we can talk about our idea. We can talk about our feeling about what happened yesterday. We can, you know, we can talk about something that happened, you know, some awful event. And, and this group of people can say, we mutually say, this should not have happened. And you can speak about that as a group, not just as an individual. We can talk about, you know, we have a habit of being a welcoming family here in this congregation. So as a congregation, you can have a habit and, as a matter of fact, like a personal self, corporate selves can grow and develop over time through experiences, encounters, habits, and, and so on. So like with a congregation. Do you remember the year that we had all of those wild and crazy prayer meetings? So we have a corporate memory. We also can have a corporate uh, 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 kind of identity. Do you, do you remember we uh, started this organization and affiliated with this group and it was through this encounter and these experiences over these times that we became an official group. So you have a group identity and encounter. We have a group habits. You know, we have a tendency here in this church to take a long time to make big decisions. You see, individuals can have cells and group can have, groups can have cells. What does this mean? What this means is that I can talk about individual worship and I can talk about corporate worship. And in this series of lectures, that's exactly what I am going to do. I can talk about us, I will talk about us encountering God and how we encounter God in worship services and in worship gatherings. But as I do so, we'll look through the eyes of corporate worship, but I'll always have in my mind a lessons for individual worship. How do I relate to God? And we will learn about how I relate to God through looking at how we relate to God. And, and vice versa. We'll do a little bit of the other as well. For example, we can talk about how we treat the less attractive members of our congregation in worship. And, and then we can learn, well, what does that teach me about how I treat the less attractive parts of my own personality and how that relates to God? You see, corporate self, individual self, the dynamics will teach us about each other. In this lecture series, I will draw from both devotional classics, personal spirituality, and I will got, draw from guides for corporate worship. My aim through this series of lectures is to provide you with a helpful, though not overly technical, introduction to the character and the questions of Christian worship, viewed primarily from the lens of corporate worship, but with always with an eye to our personal relationship with God. So, what have we learned in this, our first lecture. Number one, worship is a relational action and action quality involving both the worshiper and the worshipped. An action that can be described as a kind of reverence, as an orientation of one's whole life, and as an event around which people structure a time of reminding themselves of their connection to the worshipped. Second, more specifically, Christian worship is an essentially interpersonal affair. 
Because both God and human beings are personal, and because this personal God is actually present, we assume that Christian worship is an encounter, no matter what kind of worship we're expressing, whether individual or corporate, or whether praise or, or prayer or intercession or any of those kind of things. God is present. We are present. It's an encounter and an interaction that's essentially a worship encounter event. <clears throat> Third, worship is both corporate and personal. Because worship is a combination of all those things I said above, relational action, life orientation, and event, and because cells come in both individual and corporate types. We can explore individual worship and learn something about the common. We can explore the common and learn something about the individual. And as we shall do in this series of lectures. We're going to focus from the corporate side more, um, explore the communities of faith worship, and in very, that very exploration, we will then learn about the ways of our own personal relationship with God. You got it? So that's where we're headed, learning the whole notion of, of worship, and I look forward to this series of lectures as we go on, and I hope you have a wonderful day.